Welcome to ePartshala lecture series in computer science. This course is on operating systems and for the past few classes we have been learning about CPU scheduling. Today in this class we will continue with learning about multi-level queue scheduling and we will see how multi-level feedback queue CPU scheduling algorithm works. We will also learn about the different issues present in multiple processor scheduling and we will learn about real time scheduling and then we will understand how CPU scheduling algorithms are evaluated. So we have been seeing what CPU scheduling is in the past few classes. So CPU scheduling is nothing but having a single processor and when there are multiple processes that are waiting to use the CPU, there should be someone who selects one among the two different processes that are available and give that process the CPU. So this is done by the CPU scheduler and we have been learning about many CPU scheduling algorithms in the past few classes. We have been learning about first come first serve scheduling algorithm where the pro first process which arrives is given the CPU first and then we learnt about shortest job first algorithm where the process which has got the shortest CPU burst time is assigned the CPU and then we learnt about round robin scheduling where the CPU time is divided into slices and the process is given each time slice and then we learnt about priority scheduling where the process with the highest priority is given the CPU. And this priority scheduling can even be preemptive or non preemptive, and even uh, in SJF, it could be preemptive or non preemptive. In preemptive algorithm, say whenever a process with a low priority is working and a high priority process arrives, the low priority process is preempted and the high priority process is given the CPU. And now, continuing from this, we will move on to learn about this multi level queue scheduling. And in this queue, in this scheduling, there is uh, multiple levels in the queues. That is, in the earlier algorithms that we had seen, be it FCFS or uh, Priority or SJF, there is only a single queue of processes and one of the processes in this queue is selected and is given the CPU. But now in this multi-level queue, the ready queue is partitioned into multiple levels. That is depending upon the properties of processes, the ready queue is partitioned into multiple levels. So here I am looking at two different kinds of processes, processes which are foreground processes or which are more interactive and background processes which are batch processes which do not need much of uh, interactiveness. And these, uh, the processes that go into the different queues need different response time requirements. The foreground process or the interactive process needs a more, a much less response time or it needs a much quicker response compared to a background process which needs only, uh, only uh, less number of response or uh, only it needs, it does not need actually much amount of response. And in this case, in multi-level queue scheduling, a process is permanently assigned to a queue and the process does not move between the different queues that are available and it is assigned to the queue based on the property of the process. Say if it is a foreground process, it will be put into a particular queue and if it is a background process, it will be put into another queue. And each queue here can be given a different scheduling algorithm. Uh, it is not necessary that only one particular scheduling algorithm should be followed. Uh, one, each queue can have a different scheduling algorithm. Say the foreground process uh, queue can be given a round robin scheduling algorithm and the background process queue can be given a FCFS scheduling algorithm. And here uh, it is also possible to schedule between the different queues. So when there are multiple queues, which of the different queues should be given priority? Such a kind of scheduling also can be done. So, if there are multiple queues, it can even be done like a fixed priority preemptive scheduling applied to the different queues. So, the processes 
which are in the foreground can be given a higher priority compared to the processes that are in the background that are background processes and uh, the queue which has got the foreground process will be given a higher priority compared to the queue which has got background processes. But the problem here is that as in any priority scheduling algorithm, it is also possible to have starvation in this case also. That is the low priority background process will may not get the CPU at all compared to the high priority foreground process and the background process will now starve, they may not get the CPU. And the other uh, way in which scheduling is done among the queues is that you can give a time slice. Each queue can be given a certain amount of CPU time and uh, the, e the queue uh, will, the processes in the queue will be executed based on the time that is, that is given to that particular queue. Say for example, if your foreground process need more priority or to be given more priority, then they can be given a higher time slice or a larger time slice compared to the background queue. So what can be done is you can give 80% of time to the foreground and can use a round robin scheduling algorithm among the processes in the foreground queues and you can give only 20% of time to the background and use of FCFS among the processes in the background queue. And thereby you avoid starvation of processes that are sitting in the background queue. And this is an example of how a multi-level queue scheduling will look like. So here you see that the highest priority is given to system processes and then you have interactive processes, interactive editing processes, etc. and so on. And based on the type of the processes, they have been put into multiple queues. And the higher priority is given to system processes, the lowest priority is given to student processes and maybe the higher priority process that are sitting in the uh, topmost queue uh, will be given a different kind of scheduling compared to the processes that are kept in the lowermost queue. And so here we saw multi-level queue scheduling, we have multiple levels in the ready queue or multiple queues rather than a single queue. But the issue here, there is that the processes cannot move from one queue to another. So they came up with another uh, scheduling algorithm called the multi-level feedback queue scheduling. In multi-level feedback queue scheduling, a process can move between the various queues. It is not restricted to one queue, it can move between the various queues. And what they do here is that they separate the process with different CPU burst characteristics. And suppose if you have CPU bound processes and if you have IO bound processes, then CPU bound processes may be given a different priority compared to IO bound processes. So the process that spends too much of CPU burst time or a CPU bound process is moved to a lower queue compared to an IO bound queue. Because if a CPU bound process is given the CPU time, then that will make use of the CPU for a long amount of time and it will not let the other process to use the CPU. So CPU bound process is given low priority and IO bound process or interactive process can be given a higher priority. So if you look into this multi-level feedback queue, when processes are in a lower priority queue for a long amount of time, it can be moved to a higher priority queue and thereby you avoid starvation and aging is implemented, implemented in this manner. And this multi-level feedback queue is found to be the most general CPU scheduling algorithm. And the problem in uh, or the issue in multi-level feedback queue is that you have multiple queues and you need to define a number of parameters to design this multi-level feedback queue algorithm. One is the number of queues you need to decide upon how many number of queues you are going to allow and you need to decide on what kind of scheduling algorithm should be applied for each of the queue and then you need to decide when there are multiple levels and when there are processes in each of the levels, which of these processes and when will these processes move to upper level because we are going to give a higher priority for the one in the higher upper level and a lower priority to the one in the lower level. So we need to decide when you are going to upgrade the process to a higher level. 
and we also have to decide when you are going to demote a process or move a process down to a lower priority level. And you also have to decide upon a method to find out uh, which uh, procure a process will go in and when that process will need a service. All these have to be decided upon. So, look at an example of multi-level feedback queue scheduling. Here you see that there are three queues, Q0, Q1 and Q2 and Q0 is a, a queue where a time quantum of 8 milliseconds is defined. You use a round robin scheduling algorithm where a time slice of 8 milliseconds is defined and then you have the next queue, Q1 where a time quantum of 16 milliseconds is defined. Again, it is round robin but with a longer time slice. Then you have the say, third queue that is Q2 which defines or uh, def which def sorry, uh, we have the third queue which defines an FCFS scheduling algorithm. So, first a uh, new job enters Q0 which is served F FCFS. When it gains the CPU, it receives 8 milliseconds. But if it does not finish the job in 8 milliseconds, the job is moved to QQ1. And again in Q job in the in QQ1, the job is served FCFS and it receives 8, 16 additional milliseconds. If it is not still complete, it is preempted and you move to uh, QQ2. So, look at this diagram. Here is that first Q, Q0 and this is the Q, Q1 and this is Q2 and Q0 any process comes in first and it has been put into this queue. And here it can get 8 milliseconds of CPU time. If it finishes off its work within 8 milliseconds of CPU time, then it can exit. But if it does not finish off its CPU burst within 8 uh, time units, then it has to be moved to another queue because it is a process which has got a longer CPU burst time. And in the second queue again, it gets uh, an opportunity to use a CPU, but now for a time equal to 16 time units. If it finishes off within the 16 time units, then it can terminate, else it will be moved to a lower priority queue which where it is uh, scheduled first come first serve. And here you can see that there can be many number of processes that are sitting in this queue and between the processes that are sitting in this queue it is only FCFS. But uh, if it is not finishing within its time quantum it is moved to a lower priority queue and always this queue is given a higher priority compared to this queue and this queue is given a higher priority compared to this queue and so on. Okay. So, here you have multi-level feedback that is you have process been put into a high priority queue but is being moved to a low priority queue based on the amount of time it uses for the CPU. And now we move on to another category of scheduling algorithm where you have multiple processes. In the algorithms that we had seen till now had only one CPU or only one processor. But now this uh, sh scheduling algorithm is looking at how to schedule processes when there are multiple processes, multiple CPUs. So, scheduling becomes much more complex when multiple CPUs are available. And in this case, we are looking at only a system where there are homogeneous processes. What is meant by homogeneous processes? You have a number of processors, but all are of the similar capability or all are of the similar type. It is not a heter heterogeneous process system. We are not looking at heterogeneous process system. We are looking at only a homogeneous process system. And when you have homogeneous processors, when all the processors are of similar capability, it is possible to share the load among the different processors. So, when you have a number of processes which are waiting to get the CPU, what you do? You try to assign the CPU, assign the processes to all the processes that are available and try to get the work done as early as possible. And when you have homogeneous processors, there are two ways in which you implement the ready queue. One is you can have a separate ready queue for each of the processor and processes as and when they arrive, they are being put into the ready queues, different ready queues. 
and when one processor executes it will take the process from its respective ready queue and execute. Similarly, the other process will also do, but the problem here is that say if one processor gets some processes which need only less CPU burst time, less amount of time, that processor can quickly finish off its job and remain idle. And if another processor is there, its queue may be long because the CPU burst times of the processes that went into the second processor's ready queue may be much larger. So, the problem here when having a separate ready queue for each processor is that one processor can be idle while the other is busy. So, the solution for this is to have a common ready queue. There will be multiple processors, but there will be only one single ready queue into which all processes have been put in. And now, who will assign the processes to the different processors? So, they can be again two different ways in which it has been done. One is each processor can be self scheduling in sense each processor will pick up the process from the ready queue and execute that process or the other way is that there can be one processor among the different processors who is responsible for picking up the processes from the ready queue and assigning it to the CPU. Okay. So, the processor does the scheduling for the other processors, uh, it can be called a master processor and the other can be others can be called slave processors or you can have a master slave structure or the other way is that you can have asymmetric multiprocessing that is you can have one processor which will handle all the scheduling decisions, IO processing and other system activities everything will be done by one processor. And this one processor only will access all the system data structures and all uh, problem, all issues related to the data structures and so on. And it will take care of scheduling to the other process that the other process only do only processing. And now we move on to the next kind of scheduling that is real time scheduling. What is real time scheduling? We have already learnt about two kinds of real time systems, one is hard real time systems and soft real time systems. In hard real time systems, the time constraint is very rigid that is if a particular task or process has to be completed within a particular time, it has to finish off within that time, else the, it may result in other unnecessary problems in the system. But in a soft real time system, you will have processes other processes other non real time processes in the system in addition to the real time processes and in soft real time systems real time processes are given higher priority compared to the other processes. Now, how is scheduling done when you are looking at real time systems? So, first looking at hard real time systems as I told you a critical task has to be completed within a guaranteed amount of time. So, in hard real time systems first the process is submitted along with the time within which it has to be completed or the deadline for completion of a particular process is, is told beforehand earlier. And now with this deadline in mind the system has to decide on whether the process can be admitted or not. So, based on the time constraint the scheduler will decide whether the process can be admitted that depends on the resources that are available and uh, the resources the process is requesting for and this is called resource reservation. But the problem here is that the scheduler should know how long each type of OS function takes to perform. Only then it will know that this process needs so much of resources, so much of functions to be performed and each fun each of these functions will take so long and then based on that the scheduler can decide whether this process can be admitted or not. And when you have a system with secondary storage or virtual memory then it will be difficult to uh, guarantee the time because when you are looking at secondary storage device it may you may have disk IO and disk IO time cannot be predicted 
it may take much more than what you were looking for, what you were thinking that it will get over within. So, it is difficult to decide how much amount of time it will take to finish off a job when you have a secondary storage device or virtual memory. So, time guarantee is impossible to be given when you have a secondary storage. So, when you have hard real time uh, systems, it is composed of a special purpose software which runs on dedicated hardware so that the time constraints can be uh, can be satisfied. So, we now move on to the second type of uh, real time scheduling systems which is called a soft real time computing and in soft real time computing as I told you critical processes receive the high priority over the other processes or real time processes get high priority. So, here it is enough to implement a priority kind of scheduling where high priority is given to the real time processes and the issue here is that the priority of the real time processes should not degrade over time that is you should not allow aging. If you allow aging then the other processes which are not real time processes can get the CPU because their priority will be increased in due course of time and they may come and compete with real time processes, but that should not be allowed. So, the priority of real time processes uh, should not degrade over time and the next is the dispatch latency should be very small. What is dispatch latency? That is the time between when a process is decided to schedule or the time from when a CPU scheduler has chosen which process should be given the CPU and the time at which the first instruction of this chosen process is executed. Some amount of time will be taken. Why so much amount of time? That is already there will be some process which is running and which is using the CPU. That process should be preempted and this process should be given to the CPU or the state of the old process should be saved and the state of the new process should be loaded. So, this will take some amount of time. Okay. So, this dispatch latency that is between choosing this next process and allowing that next process to execute should be as small as possible. That is if you have a low priority process in this case and a high priority real time process arrives, the real time process should be given the CPU as early as possible. So, it is possible that in many operating systems when a low priority process is currently executing a system call, then uh, it may have to wait for some amount of time. The high priority process may have to wait till the system call of the low priority process finishes and this gets the CPU. So, so this dispatch latency to make the dispatch latency small, it is possible to make the system calls preemptible. What is meant by preempting system calls? Say low priority process is executing a system call and the system call is basically executing the kernel's code and while executing the kernel's code, how do you preempt the process? It should not result in inconsistencies of the data structure if you are preempting this low priority process. So, what is done? Some preemption points are included in long duration system calls. That is, even during the execution of the system call, in between you have some points where the data structures are consistent and during that point, it is possible to preempt this low priority process and the high priority process can be given the CPU. But this preemption points can be placed only at safe location, only when the kernel data structures are not being modified. Then the other method is to make the entire kernel preemptible. That is you have a system call that is being executed, but the data structures in the system calls are locked when the low priority process is using those system calls. And now when the high priority process comes, you can immediately preempt, but the problem is if this high priority process needs to use the same system call or the same data structure or the same code or same operating system code, then what will happen? They can, it may be possible that this low priority process had already locked some of the data structures and this high priority process may not be able to access those data structures. 
So, the high priority process will now have to wait till the low priority process finishes off its execution of this system call. So, now we see, in the, we see that this there is a priority inversion that is the low priority process gains high priority for some amount of time till it finishes off executing those system calls and then it once it finishes it will reward the priority to its original value. So, we have learnt about real time scheduling and how, how scheduling happens in a real time system and now we will move on to see how CPU scheduling algorithms are evaluated. So, you have learnt about a number of scheduling algorithms. So, how do we select a CPU scheduling algorithm for a particular system? So, the criteria may include measures like say maximize the CPU utilization such that the maximum response time should be 1 second and or you can, it can be something like maximize the throughput such that the turnaround time is linearly proportional to the total execution time. So, this kind of evaluation need to be done for different CPU scheduling algorithms. There are different ways in which this algorithms can be evaluated. One is the analytic evaluation and deterministic modeling is a kind of an analytic evaluation in which a predetermined load is taken and it is defined and the performance of each algorithm is evaluated for that particular workload. And here you can see that it is a simple and fast method of finding out. So, given a predetermined workload, you get a particular output and for each of the algorithm, you have to give the same load and try to find out what the output is. The output can be numbers in terms of say average turnaround time, response time, etc. and so on and then you can compare the different algorithms. But the, the problem here is that you need too much of exact knowledge that is the predetermined workload that you give should be exact and it should be correct. So, what is done is that you move on to a next kind of evaluation that is queuing models. In this you what you do is you get the distribution of the CPU and the IO burst and processes that run on a system may not be the same every day. There will be different processes run on particular system on different days. So, what you do you try to get the distribution of the CPU and the IO bus and what is done the distribution of the times when the processes arrive is also given and generally these distributions are uh, or uh, exponential distribution and you look at the CPU as a server with its ready queue you find out the distribution with which processes arrive you know the distributions of the CPU and the IO bus and knowing the arrival rate, knowing the service rate, you can compute the utilization, average queue length, average wait time and so on. And the next way in which you evaluate is by simulations. So, this will give you a more accurate evaluation of the scheduling algorithm. What is done is that you try to program a model of the computer system. That is the components of the computer system are represented by data structures and the clock is represented by a variable and when the clock's variable, uh, clock variable's value is incremented, the simulator modifies the system state to reflect the activities of the devices, processes, scheduler and so on. And based on this, you try to calculate the statistics and try to find out how the algorithm performs and then based on that try to evaluate the algorithm. So, you do not actually look at your re actual system where the algorithms are running, even the actual system is simulated by using data structures and you try to find out the performance of the algorithm. But the problem here is that you need to have the data to drive the simulation. So, how will the data got for driving the simulation? One is by using a random number generator. The random number generator can generate the processes, the CPU burst times, the arrival rates, the departure rates, all these based on probability distribution and then that is given as input to the different data structures or to the simulators and then try to get the performance from there. Now, the second is you can get actual real time data using trace tapes and from the trace tapes the input is given to the simulator and then run the simulator and then try to find out the output. But the problem here is that again the simulations can be expensive, it requires more number of computer time 
and this trace tapes can require large amounts of uh, storage space and developing the simulator itself is not an easy task. You need to design the simulator, code the simulator, debug the simulator and then uh, finally find out if the simulator itself is working properly or not. So that is again a major task in simulation. And the next way of evaluating algorithms is to do the actual implementation. So what should be done? The code should be, uh, the scheduling algorithm should be coded and you put the actual scheduling algorithm into the operating system and see how it is working. But the problem is the cost of the approach that is the coding the algorithm say takes some amount of time and you need to modify the OS or to incorporate or put in this particular algorithm and you also have to modify the other data structures in the operating system to incorporate this CPU scheduling algorithm. And if you keep on modifying an algorithm and give, keep on giving to users, users may, may not be willing to uh, change very frequently. They will be happy with an older system compared to a new system. So reaction of users to a constantly changing operating system is difficult. So now I conclude this topic with whatever we have learned today. We learned about multi-level queue scheduling where you have multiple levels of queues and proxy is going to different levels and each queue can have a different scheduling algorithm and you can also have a sh different scheduling algorithm between the different queues. And then you have a multi-level feedback queue scheduling where based on the performance of a process, you move the process from one queue to another. And then multi-processor scheduling where you have multiple processors and try to schedule the processes among the different processors that are available. Then real-time scheduling can be hard real-time scheduling or soft real-time scheduling and you have specific algorithms for those. And finally, we saw how these algorithms could be evaluated by different ways. References. Thank you.